John Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. everybody and welcome back before we get into the episode just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast and all that means is that we are way behind where i'm at in patreon so if you are loving this podcast and you need more john constantine in your life definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes trains and comic books and sign up for the hellblazer tier where you'll get access to the entire hellblazer library that i've recorded so far and also you get access to the exclusive episodes of the planes trains and comic books main podcast so if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we are reading Hellblazer number 59. And before we get into that, just a little catch up on the last couple issues. We had a two-issue story arc where John and his friend Chaz were fighting a corporation, I guess, that was testing ammunition on bodies of people that they had stolen from the cemetery. And the reason they got involved in this is because Chaz's uncle died and this corporation ended up stealing his corpse and they saw it. So so John and Chaz followed them and eventually figured out what they were doing. And even though they got captured and were about to be used as test subjects themselves, John was able to open the gates to a waiting area outside of heaven where the souls of these test corpses were, I guess, hanging out because they couldn't get in. They were still tied to their bodies. So John opened a portal and all those souls came and began killing everybody in the facility. And the main scientist who was running it ends up getting his eyes burned out. And while John and Chaz were escaping, Chaz found him and proceeded to beat him to death with the butt of a rifle. And we left on kind of a somber note where John and Chaz were on shaky ground a little bit in their friendship because John lied to Chaz about his uncle's soul and where it ended up after death and telling Chaz that his uncle was definitely in a better place. So first things first, with issue 59, we got the cover here. We see a naked man that looks like a demon who's crouched and the only thing he's wearing is a very large red cape with a very large collar that has popped up around his head. And he is staring at us pensively and surrounding his legs we see the demon that we have met before named Triskali, who has a snake skeleton for a body and is wearing an angel's face that it cut off in a prior battle. And we start off on the first page with a woman that we've seen before. We've only seen her, I think, one time in the Garth Ennis run. And it was when John was trying to find a cure for cancer. He was kind of at his last resort and he asked her if she could help him because she's a demon. And it turned out that she couldn't. And at first we thought she was just a regular human friend of John's. But then at the end of that conversation, she gave a really evil smile. And it was very obvious that she was a demon. And her name was Ellie. So we see her sitting in a field of overgrown grass and flowers in the center of a building that has been blown up. It kind of looks like a church. There's like a bell. But it has been turned to rubble. All the walls are crumbling and there is no roof or anything on it. And I should also describe her since we only saw her the one time. But she has long reddish brown hair. She's a white woman. But her skin looks very pale, like almost supernaturally pale. She also has very sharp and long fingernails. They look like she's either filed them or that's just how they grow. And in this peaceful area, she is only wearing a blue robe and looks to be naked underneath. And the narration says... She was picking flowers in the soul garden when he came for her. The poppies mealed as they were plucked apart, and little charges of delight tore through her. She breathed in their subtle charnel scent and lost herself in memories. In her own way, she had the innocence of an angel. And after all, this was her home. Then we get a pulled out shot where we see the ruins of the building she's in is surrounded by complete desolation and desert. Then her flower picking is interrupted by someone barging through the entrance door, which they could have walked around the rubble, but they didn't. And we see it is the demon from the front cover who we've seen before. I believe his name is the first. And this was the demon that John tricked and made a deal for him to cure John of his cancer. And when the first comes through the door, he says her name, Chantinelli. And Ellie looks up really quick and startled and they lock eyes for a second. And then the first lunges for her and the narration continues. It was all over his face, what he wanted, what he was planning, what he'd do to her. She snapped out of it, panicked, scrambled, jumped. 
And we see all those motions happen where he lunges for her and she's able to stand up and just barely get away as he grabs her hair and he actually pulls some of her hair out of her head. And when we turn the page, we see that as she jumped, she actually jumped through dimensions. So there's a really cool full page splash where we see a glass panel shattering, which I guess represents the dimensional wall. And then she is coming through a fiery pentagram which I guess is the dimensional gateway. And we see that this is part one of a storyline called Guys and Dolls, and this issue is called Fallen Women. Oh, and I forgot to mention on the cover that this is written by Garth Ennis with art by William Simpson, Mike Barriero, and Kim DeMolder. And as we turn the page, we see that the glass dimensional wall that she broke through was actually the glass of the Big Ben clock in London, England, and she crashes through that and falls down into the Thames River. And the narration says, no time to plan. Crazy arrival point. Crazy. And then as she lands in the water and kind of sinks to the bottom for a second, the narration says, and she was safe. And in the panel where we see her kind of in the water below the surface, we see that the Thames River is full of trucks and garbage and cars and all kinds of trash. Then we cut to John Constantine, who is just sitting and watching Kit sleep in the middle of the night. And his narration says, funny. I sit down in the dark for a mo just to listen to the stillness, and the next thing I know, it's five in the morning. Moggy's howling and a car alarm, a shout, a jumble rolling into Heathrow, and a little purr of breath I can hear above it all. Maybe I can't be arsed with weird shit anymore. Maybe I'm content. It's a nice thought, but deep in the back of my head, there's a mocking cackle and a voice so sure of itself it's sickening. And then we get a mind's eye of what John looks like in his own head, and it's like a cocky version of himself saying, bollocks so since john's kind of restless he decides to go out for a walk so he stands up and puts his trench coat on and the narration says too late to settle down johnny boy too many debts and scores to face up to maybe one day the devil will come to the door or the king of the vampires and then what happens kit keeps him talking while i sharpen a stake is that it i'm trapped and i did it to myself and then john hears a noise and it's kit waking up and she says uh john where are you away to and John replies, just to walk, love. I can't sleep. And then Kit rolls over in bed, and as John walks out, she says sleepily, take care. And John walks out the door. Then we come back to hell, and we're following the first as he barges in to the lair of Triskali. And he is super pissed off because Shantanelli escaped from him earlier today. So he yells, Triskali, I know you're in there, worm queen. Come out from your hole before I cut your heart from your carcass. Then we see the skeletal snake body of Triskali come forward. And like I said, on the cover, she is wearing an angel's head for a mask. And also in her den, she is surrounded by a bunch of bodies that are impaled or flayed on different pieces of wood or stone around the cave. So as Triskali comes out, it seems like she's trying to placate the first because she answers him very casually saying, my first of the fallen, my sweet Lord of hell, what troubles you, my love? But with no warning, he grabs her by the throat and he says, you do, you whore. And then he gets right in her face with his and he says, one of your succubus bitches has defied me, hag. Your sweet darling Chantinelli, who you told me would help, has fled from hell. What in damnation's name is the meaning of this? And Triscali begs him saying, please. But he doesn't listen and he grabs her even harder by the face with both hands and he says, she knows the enemy, you said. Feel free to use her against him, you said. And she answers, I didn't know. How could I? But he ignores her excuses and says, where is she? And then it seems like he pulls her head back because in this panel, it's snapped backwards with her head looking straight up. And she looks like she's in a lot of pain. And she says, she, I never knew how she met your adversary. I didn't know it mattered. I didn't know they were so close. She'll be with him. You're hurting. And the first cuts her off saying, Constantine, no, no, it's too soon. Then we cut to John in London and he's just walking the streets in the morning and he's leaning against a railing for, I think it's an offshoot of the Thames maybe, because it looks like it's supposed to be a wash or an area where rain would be directed from the city streets. And it doesn't seem like John is actively doing anything. It seems like he's just contemplating and thinking about stuff as he's leaning on this railing. So as he does that, an old man is walking his dog and he sees John and it doesn't seem like they know each other, but he just says politely, morning, cold day, isn't it? And it seems like John doesn't really want to talk, but he still says, all right, pops. 
And the man, being encouraged by John responding, says, What are you up to down here, then? Admiring the view? And John kind of chuckles and smiles and says, Dunno, maybe a bit of fishing. Then the old man glances at the wash area, and it is completely dry. There's no water in there at all. All we can see is it's full of trash and garbage, just like the Thames was earlier. So he sarcastically says to John, Good luck. And I should say, forgive me if I'm getting the layout of the, the Thames wrong, because I thought Big Ben was on the Thames, but... Maybe it's not, and this is like a different offshoot or something, but it seems like it being dry is not a normal thing because John walks down to investigate, and it seems that this river went dry very recently because when he goes to step down, it is very muddy, and as he walks, he sees that there are footprints in the mud, and he follows them to a culvert, which is a big metal tube that usually either allows water through or will direct water from the street into the river. But at the moment, it is dry as well, so he decides to keep tracking into this culvert. Then we cut to deep inside where Ellie is curled up in a fetal position, and she's kind of hugging herself, and the narration says, It was misery in there, even colder as she slipped into aftershock. But all she could think of was her home. She could never return now, not with her gardens dying in endless flame. And right as the narrator says flame, John Constantine flicks his lighter and lights a cigarette, and he illuminates the whole area around him and Ellie. And John says, hello, Ellie. And this kind of came out of nowhere. She had been in the dark for a very long time, so she's scared, and she says, you, you frighten me, John. And John doesn't seem to be here to be friends with her or anything. He just quickly asks, what do you want? And she answers, uh, I'm in trouble. I need help. And John kind of thinks about it for a second, and he thinks back to the last time they talked, where she couldn't help him, and in fact, she said that she can't help him, and he should go talk to the snob, who is the angel Gabriel, and John really hates him, and did not want to talk to him. So now as he talks to her, he sarcastically says, try the snob. And this of course pisses her off, so she yells, what? You little bastard! You think you can just sit there and be clever? The devil's after you, sunshine, and he wants to use me to get to you! And John does not like the sound of that, and as he puffs out smoke, we get the narration saying, Here we go, Kit. Sorry. And he's apologizing to Kit in his head because previously they had agreed, if they were going to live together, that John would not bring any evil into her house or bring any of his stuff home with him, that that part of his life would be separate from their part. But unfortunately, with the first after him, he knows that she might be involved after all. So while John is thinking this, Ellie says, I had to jump clean across the world. It hurt. I don't think I'll ever really be well again. He's coming after you, John. He's planning it all. How he'll untangle that stupid, thoughtless trap you caught him in. Whatever it takes. And then you'll be his. And John cuts in. And you could have stayed and helped him. I'm touched, Ellie. But Ellie says sarcastically back to him, Don't flatter yourself. If I told him what I know about you, he'd find out how we met and what happened. And then John gets really serious and he says, and we wouldn't want that coming out in the wash. And Ellie answers, no, we wouldn't. And then we see a flash of an image that she's thinking about, and it seems to be what they're talking about, whatever happened in their past. So we get an image of an angel on fire, but it's not a normal angel. Its body has been completely burned away, and it is now a skeleton. And fire is swirling around it, and the only thing untouched by the fire is the angel wings. But that was just a flash in her mind, and that flash of a memory seems to bring her down a bit, and she says, He'd tell Queen Triskelly. He'd throw me to her like a scrap of meat. I want to live, John. And John retorts, Join the club, love. So John decides to help her, and he takes her out of the culvert, and as they walk on the muddy ground, he actually puts his arm around her like he's trying to be a gentleman and warm her up, or at least make her feel safe. Then we cut back to hell where Triskali and the first are still talking and Triskali is saying to him, My love, this should surely be your time of triumph. The fallen angel has long since gone and hell is yours. And what she's talking about there is something that happened in the pages of the comic Sandman where during the last year or so, Lucifer has abdicated his throne and has left hell completely. And in the meantime, there's been like a triumvirate and a power struggle between the different lords of hell. And the first is one of them, along with his two other brothers, he calls them. So he thinks on this and he says, or as much of it as it ever will be with my two wretched brothers here. And Triskali answers, that cannot be helped, but surely now you will celebrate. Live as only the devil can. Squeeze every drop of agony from the damned and rule. So it seems like she's trying to distract him and make him forget about John. And she continues, why waste time on some paltry mortal trickster? But before she can continue, 
He figures out what she's doing and he gets very angry and he slaps her across the face, causing the angel flesh mask that she wears to fly off her head. And she's horrified by this and she says, my face, give it back, my lord, please give me my face. And the first who's now towering over her picks up the torn floppy face and he says, did Dario beg thus when you tore it from his skull? Perhaps you were right, Triskali. Hell is mine. And until Constantine's soul hangs drawn and quartered on the walls of Dis, I will not allow hell to rest an instant. Remember that and be thankful. So then he turns and he begins to walk away from her and Triskali follows him into the desert area outside of her cave. And the first keeps talking saying, what is hell coming to, I often wonder? Six years ago, we fought alongside the blessed host in the war against Shadow. Tricky little Edrigan wore the horned crown, albeit briefly. And those endless, bloody triumvirants? And to top it all, Lucifer swore vengeance on Morpheus for public insult, and Morpheus came back to hell defenseless, a perfect fruit so ripe for plucking. And the Morning Star? He quit! And then Triskali interjects, he was always too much of an angel to rule here, my lord. And if you didn't follow all the stuff that the first was talking about in that last scene, he mentions a couple of things that happen in a couple other comic books, like in Swamp Thing, when Swamp Thing came to hell and helped Edrigan fight the ultimate darkness or shadow away that was threatening during Crisis on Infinite Earths, which I believe is issue 50 or 51 of the Alan Moore Swamp Thing run. Then he talks about the Endless and Morpheus, and that's something that took place in the pages of the comic book Sandman by Neil Gaiman. And Morpheus came to hell to get his helmet back from one of the demons. And he had to battle Lucifer and Lucifer ended up losing. And I think that's a really early on issue of Sandman because that's when Morpheus' helmet had been stolen. So the first comments about what Triskali said about Lucifer being too much of an angel to rule hell. And he says, you always know just the right thing to say, Triskali. No angel belongs in hell. Those two the creator set over us, they think they do. They think they have power. And then he thinks for a second and he begins to smile and he bends down and he looks Triskali in the face and says, now, what are we going to do about this little Miss Chantinelli? Then we cut to a motel room where John and Chantinelli are sitting and we see John looks kind of worried and Chantinelli looks like she's just taking a shower and she's sitting on the bed only wearing a towel. And John's narration says, I can't take her home. I mean, what's Kit gonna say or think? We blag our way into a B&B, &B, and while she's cleaning up, some gear falls off the back of a lorry for her. And then it's coffee, sardines, and the latest gossip from down below. And we see Chantanelli is drinking coffee and talking to John saying, the real reason the devil hated Lucifer was that Lucifer always beat him at chess. And John answers, yeah, I heard about all the changes. I got a postcard from Perth. And Chantanelli says, I wish it were the light bringer we were up against, John. He'd probably just get bored and forget about us. But this one, he has a long memory. And what you've done to him, it can't be forgotten. And then John kind of smirks and says, Don't know why. I hardly raised a finger against him. And then Ellie looks at him and says, Things aren't that bad if you can laugh at the devil, is that it? Oh, John. Oh, poor, poor John. The Christians say the Nazarene died for their sins, don't they? That he endured a thousand agonies but you'll die for your sins alone. And when he gets his hands on you, you'll beg for what the Christ brat got. You have to understand who this is, John. Lucifer got fed up with hell, bargaining for souls, the war with heaven, spreading badness like a cancer, all of it. But that's meat and drink to him. He's the adversary, the serpent in the garden, old Nick, Satan, the devil, the first of the fallen. You see, Lucifer fell, but when he got to the bottom, someone else was already there. They say that he'd been there since creation, that he was the first to be, and the Redeemer threw him out of heaven for daring to think for himself. Lucifer had been the greatest of the archangels, and he could never match such power. But the Morning Star is gone, and now there's no one in his way. So while ali has been talking, we've been seeing little flashes of what she's talking about with Lucifer and the first. So we see an angel in pain who's falling from heaven, and that's Lucifer. So when Lucifer lands in the darkness, uh, we see someone is already there, and it is the first. And also, I will mention that while Ellie is talking to John, every panel of her is her posing in a seductive way. And I don't think she's actually trying to seduce John here. 
But I do think that because she's a succubus, it's in her nature to kind of just have these positions as she's talking to John. And I guess because everything that she's talking about is so serious, John doesn't take notice of any of her poses while they're talking. So John stands up as Ellie stops talking and he says, finished. And she's taken aback by his cavalier attitude. And she says, but, but John cuts her off saying, Ellie, maybe it's in my best interest to keep him away from you, but you need me more than I need you. You owe me anyway. But after this, it'll be big time. No moaning, no bullshit about me asking too much. No evil smiles and stupid bloody advice. Savvy? And Ellie replies, I, yes. And John says, good. Because one of these days, love, one of these days I'm going to collect. And with that veiled threat, that is the end of the issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.